Hi, I'm Laura. Hey, I'm Stefan, and you're listening to Attributed, a podcast library by Dream Data. The purpose of it is to store and share all the knowledge that we have gathered across Dream Data employees through our LinkedIn Lives, podcasts, and webinars. The typical topics you'll find here can be stuff like marketing, sales, B2B ads, operations, social selling, maybe. Today, we have uh, Fran here, Fran working from uh, War Queen 4, uh, Cognizant, which I think all of us who, who spend a lot of time on LinkedIn see this company quite a lot. And um, you guys have been very vocal about marketing tactics and demand generation in, in general. So I think somebody uh, at some point tagged you in one of my posts saying you should definitely talk to Fran. And I think that's how our whole conversation here started out. But before I give the word to you. I just want to say to like you guys listen, listening in, if you have any questions to, to Fran, you just write it in the, the chat there and uh, I'll bring them up as we as we go along. But I was just saying to you, Fran, before we, we started, it's, 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 you guys are definitely leaving a mark on my LinkedIn stream as I, I think I know you guys more from, from the posts you do than, uh, than actually the ads that you run. But then again, also your ads look so natural that it might be, <laughs> you might think that there are LinkedIn posts once in a while. Anyway, we'll package that uh, when we get to the lead gen versus demand gen and all that sort of stuff. But what's the kind of one, two minute intro to, to yourself, friend, and, and what you do? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Um, that lovely welcome. So yeah, I um, head up the global demand gen here at Cognizant. So really my role, predominantly my, my whole role is focusing on creating demand for our core ICP and our audience and working really closely with our paid team to on, on the capture demand piece, right? So capturing those, um, the sort of one to 2% of people that are in market for, for our product. So um so yeah, I run a uh, sort of the DG team and, and then all our sort of DG managers and our content um, DG execs and managers as well are all aligned to this creating demand and, and, and really just providing as much value as possible um, to our audience. So yeah, that's like our main main focus right now. Our main goals are, are just to do just that really. And was this kind of, uh, I was actually just thinking out loud or th thinking inside myself, was this the title you were hired to do? Was the, or was this kind of an organic shift uh, that you, you entered into? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I was, um, I joined Cognizant about, oh gosh, almost, almost three years ago, actually now, yeah. which is so quickly. Um, I was hired to really under the old lead gen model. So I was hired as a, a growth marketer, a senior growth marketer, yeah. and really it was, we were, we were operating under this lead gen strategy. So the main focus was to, to be honest, to get as many leads as possible for sales and you know, hope that kind of transpired into meetings, but meetings attended pipeline. So I'd say like, you know, two, two and a half years ago, um, I was thinking, how can I get the most leads in the funnel as yeah. quickly as possible? So it has been a real shift for us. You know, if I went to Alice, our CMO now and said, got you some leads, she'd be like, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's been an interesting um, i think this whole demand generation talk has also inf uh, changed how i i perceive marketing as well I, I was very much coming from the same perspective as you like I, I need to get them to click here so i can track them coming to the website and then get them to convert there as a last touch so i know that it came from <laughs> whatever oh, yeah. app that I set up. Like yeah, you had to hang on to it. You had to send those leads to sales, but you had to hang on to them in terms of attribution just to prove that you kind of funneled them through. But yeah. It's, yeah. Um, but if we if we take a step back and for those who are kind of not completely into the, the lingo, I guess <laughs> maybe we can start. Maybe you can start in your words then explaining what kind of we titled this conversation lead generation to the demand generation. I guess it's fair to say that it sits somewhere under the marketing umbrella or like in a, in a traditional company you would call this marketing, but then it's a tactical or strategical focus within when you, how you do marketing. I don't know how you would express uh, like what was the old way you were coming from and where is it that you've landed now? Yeah. Okay. So I suppose mm -hmm. like just, I guess I refer to it kind of like in the models that we were operating under. So a lead gen model to me just quite simply is collecting leads, sending them an email, funneling that through to sales and sales calling them. And, you know, 90% of the time, 95% of the time collecting low intent leads. So by low intent leads, I mean people that either don't even know 
your product or service or are certainly nowhere near ready to buy. You know, like lead generation for me is collecting leads from ebooks and sending them to sales quite yeah. um, with which I must say we did very successfully um, yeah. a few years ago. So, and then I guess the switch that we've made, which now is, I guess, is quite sort of a buzz term on LinkedIn and sort of in, amongst the marketing community is, is this demand gen approach. Quite simply for me, the, the switch has been that we now meet our audience where they actually hang out on the channels that they hang out yeah. um, and deliver them value consistently, essentially. So, and by delivering our audience value, it's, completely getting rid of all the friction no forms and um, not sending them somewhere just because we want them to go to a specific page it's like delivering value where they are so a great example of that is I would do an ad on LinkedIn two years ago and I would send them to a web page because that's where I needed them to be yeah. because I needed them to fill out my form and I needed that lead to go through the funnel and and now I'm you know me and the team are, are working together and saying right let's deliver a vertical video on LinkedIn, we'll put it on a reach objective and we don't, we need to be super valuable. So it's almost like someone has taken some really good insights before they've clicked anywhere, before they've gone anywhere. And we've, we've added that value in the first like 10 seconds, as opposed to sending them, you know, from pillar to post, because that's where we need them to go. So that's, that's really like the big shift that we've made. It's quite an eye opener when, when kind of the, you really get it. <laughs> I think for, for me, I, it was kind of a progression where of like thinking of there's only so many buyers out there right now that are like specifically in market. Yeah. So if we want to grow, we need to step outside that one, two percent of the market of those actively searching demand capture, you probably call it out there. So we cannot accelerate faster if we just stick here. So we need to like move from in market to the right people and then try to just focus on feeding them the right message so that whenever their demand is ripe for capturing in terms of they have budget, they have the project or whatever timing, why the timing is right, then you attract them. And for what I really like, the, I think my hardcore experience was when we started using a lot of money, or at least on, on LinkedIn and running yeah. ads there. And running ads that where the purpose was not to get a click. The purpose was to serve a video, an image, or like a carousel or something like that. As long as I was sure that it was the right audience, then I wouldn't look too much at whether could I get them to click this button. And what we saw then within Dream Data was that direct traffic went up in terms of generating leads. Organic search went up in terms of being a channel where people come in directly through search and then book a demo. Sorry to interrupt, just out of interest. I know you're supposed to be yeah. asking me the question. How long, how long did that take for you to see the trend upwards? Just I think it was actually quite immediate, like right. within a month of, uh, of starting to do it. I think it's also it depends on the size of your company. Now, at that stage, we were probably only like 15, 20 people or something like that. Whereas um, I think when you shift a bigger ship like Cognizant, the impact might, there might be a bit more delay because... There's a lot of stuff move, moving. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, we, yeah, it's, uh, it was about, well, it was like over a three month sort of period, we started seeing our inbound demo requests trending upwards. And um, I think I just, I really like how you described it because um, it's just like a very simple approach in, in the sense that it's, we want to see our traffic increasing, our inbound demo requests trend upwards. But there's no like headaches around like exact attribution or exactly where it came from. And, and that's why Alice was quite strong on um, our CMA when she was leading us through this. It was like, let's just don't worry about getting in the weeds of like, it's from here to here to here. Let's just see if by doing this, we see a trend. Like, yeah. We see this trend. And I think the way you explained it is, is similar. And, and um, I think it's a very good way of, of pro approaching it, if you like. Yeah. What was, what was the kind of, what was the kind of infliction point uh, kind of and like how do you join that together with getting management back up to to do this yeah. kind of change in uh, like you're used to put let's say you're used to putting in a hundred uh, like a thousand leads to the sales team every month now you go down to only giving them 500 or 200 or something yeah like so the question oh so the so i guess like you, the change upwards and sort of doing the full switch what did you feel was, why was it necessary to do a change in how you approach, let's call it marketing? Um, so I think for us, we, we'd kind of come to a point with lead gen where we, 
we we pretty much got it covered in the sense that we were I think it was around sort of 800 to 1,000 leads a month were going to sales. Oh, Almost wow. like too many leads at one point. Yeah. Um, so we kind of had this really, really well-oiled machine. Yeah. And it was like sort of delivering, and, and we, we could predictably say like, this is the amount of revenue that we're going to get. This is what this lead gen model is bringing us. But really like the more we went on and for, for us as a marketing team to take more of a meaningful seat at that revenue table, mm. Yeah. to build on that and grow and I, we didn't know how we could grow further from that we'd kind of yeah. hit the ceiling with with them um, you know we know if we have x amount of leads this is the revenue but how could we unlock like the next step yeah and and honestly like we were listening to chris walker like refine yeah. labs and, and they were talking yeah. about this strategy and, and it made a lot of sense it was it was logical and um, why not operate in a way that aligns with like the modern buyer like why you know we should be doing that and yeah. um, we really just needed to kind of find a way to unlock that next level of growth and also something I that has always stuck with me throughout this journey is is um Chris Walker talked a lot about uh, splitting the funnel and um so we did that ourselves so um we um we said right how many content leads which is like the ebook downloads yeah. into sales yeah. How many of those leads do we need to get a close one deal? And, <laughs> and how many leads, how many inbound demo requests, people, hand raises, I want to know more, I want a demo. How yeah. many of those do we need to get a close one? And on paper, I, these aren't the figures exactly, but it was something like 500 content leads for one close one and like 25 inbound demo requests for like one yeah. close one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. just having it in black and white on paper, they're the figures, it was, it seemed like a no brainer that we would do everything that we could to be top of mind and encourage these inbound demo requests instead of essentially like buying yeah. like low intent leads, right? From events or whatever. Yeah. It's uh, crazy. <laughs> well, it sounds so simple when, when it's, uh, it's, it's said like that. I think it also comes from, I guess there's been more like a more grand shift from like in B2C, we've been used to being able to kind of prove return on investment from our activities. Whereas in B2B, it's, it's been harder. But now like B2Bs are starting to understand that, hey, when we do marketing in B2B, it's actually also supposed to drive pipeline and demo requests and, and new business and yeah. not just emails. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. How, how uh, just like very simplistic, uh, how do you then determine how much revenue you source or how much pipeline you build for the, the sales team? What is kind of the handover mechanics? Uh, there? Yeah, so we have, so um, we have like revenue targets, like the same as sales in terms of like what is kind of like, again, it's everything I'm saying is like quite simple, but I appreciate a lot of organizations, a lot of complex processes and different layers. But I think the lucky thing for us is we we have a CEO that is completely bought in to marketing and, and Alice, our CMO, has, has done an amazing job of communicating upwards that we want to have that seat at the revenue table and we want to hold a target. So, you know, we hold like anything from like 50, 50, 57 percent of the revenue target. We are aligned with sales. We have the same goals like we are responsible as much as they are for bringing revenue in. So that has been a big shift for us. And that, that target has got bigger as time has gone on and rightly so, because we want to be able to build that out and, and just drive like meaningful revenue in the same, exactly the same way. Like I don't see it as being different. One thing I've always struggled a little bit with in, in this demand generation discussion has been kind of what budget do you go ask for when mm -hmm. like if we get like uh, if we you take the scissor and cut the rope between uh, we got the click and then the demo was booked how do you guys deal with this kind of this kind of discussion i've never really like i found the way to take a, to to grab this one yeah so i guess how we started was we asked for a, a testing budget so we actually started with we called it like a cmo testing budget i think we've got it i think it was like udi was um was talking about this and we kind of followed suit and said right we're going to ask for small budget. So it was 5K that we asked mm. for. Yeah. And we're going to ask for 5K for every month for three months. And we're going to put it completely. We actually took our worst performing gated ebooks yeah. and we ungated them. Mm. Um, so the ones that weren't bringing in like 
as you know we had like two playbooks that brought in like the most leads so we ungated them we set them up in a very value-led way we and, and just really just launched those ads on LinkedIn and we just had the ungated sort of campaigns running the gated campaigns running at exactly the same time and yeah. we tracked the the velocity right the inbound demo yeah. velocity and our goal was give us 5k a month and the inbound demo request will go up that was the test <laughs> and and, yeah. and it worked and we you know we, we built on that i was running the enterprise sort of segment at that time and um, so i was on a bit of a lag time so because it was quite a new segment for us so i was running the dg and the demand uh, and the lead gen stuff like yeah. probably for like six months like alongside mm. one another and slowly just moving budget out and because <laughs> we couldn't our sales team like we were giving them like almost a thousand leads a month we couldn't just yeah. be like guys <laughs> they're good you know that's kind of we've yeah, turned yeah. Off. there was a lot of internal conversations we had to have and, and we just had to really you know the, the conversation's easy in the sense that of course the sales team are want to gonna want to handle leads that are high intent and are ready to buy and want the demo but it was you know, it's that sort of change management piece where we were all living in this like safety comfort yeah. blanket of leads, you know, like, I think it's a, like I was just like thinking about what are the like practical things you do to like shift. And I think it's, it's brilliant to just let's start with small bits and then let, let's have an experimental budget and see how, the, how does the ad platforms respond when we, we put in this budget. I saw you did a, a mother recommendation on LinkedIn probably yesterday about also just like uh, what did you call it double budgeting or like double reporting with like one set of metrics the old way and then a new way of uh, having metrics uh, as well yeah so actually I mean I basically we kind of were in a situation where we were running like two models and I just think that if the metrics that the board are used to seeing and, and the results they're used to seeing are obviously under this lead gen yeah, yeah you cannot it. just from one day to another just come in and say, okay, these are the new numbers. Exactly. And we yeah. can't just say, oh, guys, these are new numbers. And uh, we have like, we have 100 leads, not 1,000. But don't worry, because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's difficult. So I think actually, but also the test that we were running, it was very important to us that we weren't communicating it as a little, you know, little experiment or anything. We needed to, to kind of show that the importance of it. So when Alice did go to like board meetings or like RevOps meetings at the end of the month, she would have like a slide, which was like, here's your usual numbers that you're used to seeing. But then a slide afterwards would be just like super engaging. So it would be like, okay, guys, we had 5K this month. We have, I don't know, launched these ads and we've sent out these like newsletters and we've sent people to this ungated piece of content. Mm -hmm. Here's the comments that we've had back. So she would screenshot the emails. Oh, wow. um, we'd put on like, a live event no sign up required and there were comments you know like this is so refreshing this content has been really valuable and you know all that kind of stuff so yeah. it was almost like even though we didn't have the hard numbers we yeah. had our prospects our icp telling us this is what they wanted so yeah. i was just used to to show that again and again um, and yeah. and and just have it on every sort of important meeting like that to yeah. really kind of get you like leadership used to seeing us reporting in yeah. that way and then buying into that value if you like so um it was it was like that for a while before mm. we made the full switch but that's what i mean by kind of like double reporting you have yeah to. i think that's a brilliant is, is there a so start with small buckets double reporting is there like one or two more things you'd say that helps the the transition or or are they two the, the main things i'd say the main things were well, I'd say for most people, the two object two kind of objections that you'll have from for the demand gen thing is one is is budget. So you might not always and and my answer to that is, you know, we started out with with five k. You don't have to have like hundreds of thousands of dollars no. to kind of test this. So I think that's kind of like really important to sort of know. And then on the opposite, I guess like that's what I'd say for the smaller companies. And then I find for the larger enterprise companies, it's kind of like, well, we've spent three months from sort of, you know, October to December, mapping out our whole 2023 plan, it's all centered around a lead gen model and it's all mapped out in the financial plan. And that's what my budget is into. So it's going to be very difficult for me now to go to leadership and say, oh, actually, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to switch to this demand gen model, but I haven't proven it out yet. 
So that's where, um, and it was, we got this, like Udi from Gong spoke about this. That's where he was talking about this testing budget. So it's much easier to get a smaller testing budget than obviously just making that full switch. So I think that's probably the best way I've seen it done or how it's worked for us internally anyway. Super nice. And I think the, you almost covered it, but Kareem is asking here, how do you convince leadership in adopting demand gen opposed to, to lead gen? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like what I've said, right? It's, it's reporting both back upwards. It's committing to it as well. If you're going to do that test, commit to communicating about it, commit to seeing it through yeah. to the end and really, really owning it. I think as well, it's, it's, it is having that confidence because it's, you know, if you're going into meetings and you're saying, oh, we're trying this, we're not really sure. I think even that kind of language is not getting buy-in from people. But if we're yeah. going in and saying, we're testing this because we know this is where we're going to go, or we have yeah. to go, otherwise we're not going to grow, then it's a very different kind of attitude than just, it might work, it might not. Yeah, I think this this goes for all marketing activities. You need to take responsibility for your own uh, fate. <laughs> You have to agree on a plan in your team, what you're going to do. And then you have to come up with a narrative of why are we doing it? Why do we think it's valuable for the company? And you have to be able to defend that narrative in the way that Alice did with, okay, my metrics is like screenshots of ICPs that really, really appreciates this type of content. And now you see also the demo calls is going upwards and the quality of the demo calls is, is great and stuff like that. Um, one thing I would like stuff we talk about a lot about here at Dream Data is kind of the collaboration between marketing and sales. So what's the communication with the sales team in, in this demand generation strategy? Do they follow up with like outbound pokes to the, the accounts or is there any anything going on there? Yeah, so I think, well, the conversations become easier because the leads we're delivering are of higher intent. We do align on uh, target accounts and things such as that. We don't at Cognizant, like we don't do like a full sort of ABM play. So um, I know some companies do, and that's where there's that alignment with sales. But what we have done is got the sales team just really bought into what we're doing. So for us, just getting them involved in the content, they've seen our profiles on LinkedIn and kind of what we're doing. Some of them have, have mirrored that and taken similar action and really invested in their own personal branding and but for them, it's it's almost like sharing in the success of, you know, having a call and saying, oh, we heard about you because there's this amazing, you know, you've mm. done this amazing podcast or something yeah. like that. So the, the collaboration is is definitely a lot stronger than it was. I guess before um, the, the friction point was there was a huge lead queue and mm. the, the interactions I would have with sales would mostly be, you know, are you following up on the leads? Are they good? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And them going, yes, no, usually no. And that was yeah, and also just the sheer volume of salespeople you need. If you hand them, here's a hundred, no, here's a thousand you need to talk to every month. You need a huge sales team to to run that. Yeah, Whereas, exactly. like, if it's high quality stuff, then you maybe only need 10, 20, 30% of those <laughs> salespeople yeah. to, to handle the leads. There's a question from Kirill here. I'll try to bring it down on the screen. Oh, what oh, yeah, are the key it. metrics you're suggesting to look after in a dimension funnel? Yeah, it would be quite nice to just hear what are kind of the key things that Alice and uh, you guys put into the, the decks when you report. Yeah, sure. So we kind of have, um, obviously our end goal is, is revenue. I have talked about like the importance of having that seat at the revenue yeah, table. Yeah, yeah. And we kind of break it up into two. So of course there are those like conversion metrics for our capture demand piece. So those in market, we want to make sure that we're getting those conversions like as cheap as possible and, and sort of doing well there. And then for our capture demand piece, it's really around our engagement metrics. So probably maybe I used to refer to them two years ago as like vanity metrics or stuff that. <laughs> wouldn't be very important to me are now the most important thing yeah, yeah. um, when reporting. So for us, we have spent some time building out a media machine. And by a media machine, I mean a continuous feedback loop, or Alice is now termed a value loop, which is great. So it's, it's building a following or an audience. They don't have to sit anywhere specific, but who are engaged in our newsletter, our podcast, our live events, and we're continuously delivering them value. And really like for us, it's like measuring the engagement like from that audience. So yeah. what qualitative feedback have we had? Like what positive signs that the content we're talking about is, is correct or, or correct or like aligns with them and, and resonates yeah. with them. And then 
really it's things like on if we're running our LinkedIn ads now, it's it's not necessarily a click only like a click through rate. We're saying, OK, well, we're going to run a video ad. So we're going to run a video yeah. in feed. We really, really want to know the engagement rate, the completion rate, comments yeah. on the video. Yeah. And that's a very different way of reporting than we've had five clicks through to because often yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've spoken to companies that have run video ads and then said can you help me like they messaged me on LinkedIn saying can you help me my click-through rate is really low <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I'm thinking well you should be running this on a reach objective and looking at completion rate and engagement yeah. rate so the click-through rate shouldn't matter like and I think often like people forget the people are so used to just doing traffic click-through that really you should be optimizing for a lot sort of like less like CPM, like CPM is less, like your coverage is like a lot cheaper. If you're focusing on something that's reach and you're engaging somebody in feed, yeah. I don't mind, I don't, I look at the click-through rate, but it's not something that I'm like beholden to and I'm reporting on like every single week. So yeah. I think it's it's really just making sure that you you know what you're measuring and why. And it's not just like, <laughs> And, and benchmarks as well. Um, yeah, is just about they must have some benchmarks for mm. what good engagement looks like. And I think it's definitely a good sanity check to whether, like, have you selected the right audience? Is it the right message you're placing in front of them? Is the ad, is there a good flair to it? And then if definitely. there is, then the engagement rate is high. And if it's if it's not, then you should go home and do better creatives. <laughs> yeah, like, it's all about that testing and then... I think I remember like when I started marketing years ago and I'd what's the best email I go on MailChimp and, and Google like best email open rate benchmarks or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. find these benchmarks from a Gartner report or a Forrester report or something like that. And then um, and now it's like what we're very clear on is we make our own benchmarks because mm. every business is different. The size of the team, the budgets, the product, like some products like our sort of deal cycle is sort of 30 yeah. 40 days some yeah. people have i've worked in roles where the deal cycle is like 18 months um you have to really rely on sort of making your own benchmarks essentially yeah, yeah. yeah. at the end of the day it's just the game is just about making the engagement rate a little bit better month on month all the time exactly rather yeah. than trying to like compare with somebody who's not similar to you yeah and it's hard because at the beginning you don't have benchmarks so you have to just go with it and and sort of after around some sort of two or three months, you yeah. can start to start maybe to just uh, just before we we round off. Then would like to ask where can it go wrong, or like if you were to like warn people of places to play pay attention to, if you if they like say they're deciding on trying to do this shift, what are the pitfalls? What can be like where do you fall down if you're not focused on particular things? Yeah, I think spreading yourself too thin. So hmm. doing things across every chat, making the change across every channel, just because you feel like you need to be on every channel. I'd say like go double down on the channel or in the places where your audiences hang out. Yeah. So it could be on LinkedIn. It could be on Reddit. It could be on a very, very niche group for manufacturers because that's your audience, right? So yeah. I'd say like that's where that's kind of like where it can go wrong sort of like when you're spreading yourself too thin and the second thing for me is lack of consistency so if you're going to start on one channel delivering one it might be sort of one sort of content type or one like specific ads or even like a podcast or whatever I just think that you have to do that consistently and do that very very well and don't worry about being on every channel all of the time I would say yeah, like you at least need a very large team in order to really master how the dynamics is of of each platform and how the ads perform and how the algorithm behaves, etc. Definitely. And your audience might not even be there. So you really <laughs> have to take, you really have yeah. to take time. <laughs> Any last things you think feel like, friend, is important to get across in this kind of the, the shift from lead gen to demand gen or any like advice you want to want to give people? I guess the main thing for me is it's okay to start small and it's going to be a little bit different to everybody for everybody. So there's no, not going to be one direct sort of blueprint. Um, it's definitely like, obviously I champion it. It's definitely worth doing, but I'd say like, don't put the pressure on yourself to kind of make that switch overnight. Like I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of like internal conversations that you have to navigate. So yeah, start small test and be consistent and, and you, you can definitely get there. And it's, it's definitely worth doing, right? So if you just think about how you buy today, that's how we want to 
align with, you know, we want to align with the modern buyer. And if you think about how you buy yourself and yeah. you're not doing that with your audience, then there is, you know, there's that disconnect there. Wonderful. And if people want to ask you a question, can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Happy. And maybe you should just, uh, before we stop the let's have the, the, the short Cognizant pitch. So people actually know what Cognizant does as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, if you we've completely simplified our messaging and I'm going to be very direct in that we give you B2B emails and mobile numbers of people you want to do business with. So we are a B2B data provider. And um, yeah, we used to talk about it in a fancy way, sales intelligence platform, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. being wonderfully simple um, <laughs> actually works a lot better. So that's a good marketing. Email emails and mobiles <laughs> come to us. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Um, so last things, if you like a conversation like this, you can uh, either jump into our Slack community or you can go listen to our podcast. We've termed it uh, attributed so people can go go search for that. Fran, thank you so much for, yeah, for taking you. this time. I, I definitely learned a lot about the man generation, which I didn't know before. So, so I really appreciate it. And um, I hope the listeners <laughs> does as well. We hope you like listening to us. Subscribe to our podcast and the ones that we have been guests on. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, just do let us know. And should there be a guest that you think we should be talking to, then like pitch us. We're looking forward to seeing you.